Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Before we begin, I want to just take a, an opportunity to thank my colleague, Professor Jonathan Walton, who is the Pusey Minister of the Memorial Church, and all his staff for their gracious hospitality in this beautiful venue that we're in uh, today. So we appreciate uh, your hospitality. Thank you. So my name is David Hempton, and as Dean of the Harvard Divinity School, it's my distinct honor and great privilege to welcome you, Your Holiness, um, 17th Karmapa to Harvard University to speak about a topic that's very near and dear to all our hearts and minds, caring for life on earth in the 21st century. Your Holiness, we are deeply honored by your presence with us today. And to mark this historical and special visit, I have the privilege of presenting a welcoming gift to you, a memorial bowl that is engraved with our Harvard Divinity School seal, and the words presented to His Holiness, the 17th Karmapa, with the highest appreciation on the occasion of his historic visit to the Harvard Divinity School, Cambridge, Massachusetts, March 26, 2015. So this is my pleasant response. So it's my pleasure to welcome all of you, members of the entourage of His Holiness, honored lamas, faculty, students, and staff at Harvard, as well as our friends and guests from near and far, who are both physically present with us here at the Memorial Church, um, and also those joining us via our live web stream. A very warm welcome to everyone. Your Holiness, as you know, the Harvard Divinity School has had a long-standing, cordial, and friendly relation with important representatives of Tibetan Buddhism. In 1976, we welcomed His Holiness the 16th Karmapa to HDS following an invitation from our Hollis professor, Harvey Cox. And on April 30th, 2009, we had the honor of hosting your mentor and teacher, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, here in this very church, on exactly the same spot we are sitting right now. Six, um, six years ago, His Holiness the Dalai Lama spoke about educating the heart was the topic. And you also have addressed this in your inspiring and beautiful book, The Heart is Noble, Changing the World from the Inside Out. I really recommend you get this book and read it. It's a wonderful read. It seems a natural continuation of this dialogue, therefore, to direct our views now to the future and to the 21st century. And we're excited to hear your thoughts on this vital topic in just a few moments. First, please allow me to say just a few words about Harvard Divinity School's important connections with Buddhism. As many of you know, HDS has had a thriving Buddhist ministry program since 2011. This program is an important part of our mission to educate leaders who are conversant in world religions, as well as ministers who can lead spiritual communities and provide guidance as religious professionals appropriate to modern global conditions. With the support of a generous gift from the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation, Harvard Divinity School has thus been able to expand its offerings in ministerial training to include the study of Buddhist ministry. Along with our students, the driving force behind many of these exciting developments has been my friend and colleague, Professor Janet Gyatso, the Hershey Professor of Buddhist Studies and Associate Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs at Harvard Divinity School. We also have the honor of welcoming among our guests this afternoon the generous donor behind Professor Gyatso's chair, Mr. Barry Hershey. So a special welcome to him. Hmm. Professor Gatso and her team in academic affairs have put together today's event, and our sincere thanks go to all of you for um, putting this together so well. So it's now my great pleasure to welcome Professor Gatso, herself an internationally acclaimed scholar of Tibetan Buddhism, and the author recently of a large and very important book on the history of medicine in early modern uh, Tibet, to introduce our honored guest. 
So, Janet, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. It's an amazing honor for me to be able to introduce the great hero, His Holiness the 17th Karmapa, Ugin Tsinle Dorje, to you this afternoon. I myself have never met him before until today, but of course I've heard so much about him, and it's really a great thrill and honor to finally meet him in person. Our speaker this afternoon is the 17th in a line of tukus, or officially recognized reincarnating lamas. Each in that line were recognized as young boys by disciples of the prior deceased Karmapa on the basis of special signs, indications, and instructional letters. The first Karmapa, Dusam Kemba, was born in 1193. He is probably the first Tibetan master to produce a recognized incarnation after his own death. This in in reincarnation, or recognized tuku, was the second Karmapa, Karmapakshi, who was an amazing meditator and master who spent years as a hermit. He later visited Kublai Khan, and he also met Marco Polo. The third Karmapa, Rangchun Dorje, was a brilliant theorist. He wrote about the spiritual capacities and pathways in the human body. And his magnum opus, called Sapmo Nangdun, or in English, The Profound Inner Meaning, has also been very important for my work as a scholar. The fifth Karmapa was the teacher of the Ming Emperor Chengzu, who offered to send troops to place all of Tibet under the Karmapa's rule, which the Karmapa declined. Mikyo Dorje, born 1507, wrote copiously on Buddhist phenomenology and Buddhist deconstructive metaphysics. He was also invited to visit the Chinese court, but he declined. The 11th Karmapa, Chuyin Dorje, was a great and original painter and sculptor. He creatively expanded upon old art styles from both India and China. The 16th Karmapa, Rangchung Ripa Dorje, was born in the 20th century and escaped Tibet in 1959, taking many of the Karmapa lineage's sacred treasures and relics with him. He had already composed poetry back in the 40s, foretelling Buddhism's imminent demise inside Tibet, and he realized that an important site for the future of his traditions might be the West. He went to meet Pope Paul and later set up many Buddhist centers in Europe and the United States. He died in Illinois in 1981. It is said that he was able to communicate with animals. Once, while teaching in Europe, a large raven tapped on the window where His Holiness was speaking. The bird then flew into the room and directly over to His Holiness, who then instructed two people to go to a barn a few miles down the road where they would find two birds, trapped and starving. They went and birds were discovered there and they rescued them. The 16th Karmapa was actually famous for having a special fondness for birds, and he considered a visit to the local pet shop in every city in the world an essential part of his itinerary. No doubt, he was murmuring quiet mantras and blessings to the birds when he met them. The current Karmapa is Ugyen Tinle Dorje, the 17th Karmapa, in whose presence we are today. He is no less exceptional than any of his exceptional predecessors, or should I say his previous lives, and by the way, I would advise you to look um, on Google. You can search the 16th Karmapa, and you'll see a certain resemblance, um, at least in my opinion, <laughs> a certain glow. It's very similar. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm here to tell you that the Tugu system in Tibet is alive and well. The master and teacher before us is obvious evidence of it. Ugyen Tinle Dorje was born into a nomad family in the Latok region of eastern Tibet in 1985. He became a monk at the age of four, and then at the age of seven, he was recognized as the 17th Karmapa by a team of Karmakagyu lamas who were traveling around Tibet on a search team, carrying with them the prediction letter written by the 16th before he died. The signs matched, and the boy was installed at the old monastery Tsurpu in north-central Tibet, where he arrived from the east on horseback with high pomp and procession. This was in 1992. He began to be trained there to be the head of the Karmakagyu school and to take up the position that his former life had occupied. 
So this is the Tuku system of Tibet. A special child is formed by a group of masters and monks to become a teacher of wisdom and compassion, a visionary to lead his people. And this is especially important in these times of great duress for his people. And at the age of 14, I think maybe a thunderbolt hit him, I don't know, but he thought, he realized that he needed to be outside the strict surveillance of the Chinese authorities and instead in the ambiance of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama and the many other high teachers who were in exile in the Indian Himalayas, he really needed to receive the necessary teachings for his education. So plans were made carefully, and one night he climbed out of an upstairs window in his monastery residence and accompanied only by his trusted head steward, who by the way is with us today, and a few guides, he made his way across the Himalayas by car, foot, horseback, helicopter, train, and taxi to Dharamsala, India, where he showed up, none the worse for the wear, uh, at the door of the Dalai Lama uh, one week later. I remember well that day, January. <laughs> January 5, 2000, when the headline hit the world press. I remember well gazing at his face in the newspaper the next day. I felt, even from that distance, the bold and intelligent and amazingly honest energy of this young man from Eastern Tibet. It was also thrilling that the Dalai Lama, the exile leader of the Tibetan people, along with the many other great lamas of Tibetan Buddhism, were reunited with another member of the really upper, upper echelon of Tibetan Buddhist authority, the Karmapas. It was all purely a result of vision and determination that the right thing should happen. And so it did. His Holiness the 17th Karmapa did indeed continue to study in detail in India, receiving a variable treasure trove of teachings. He has also been pursuing concerns in the larger world far beyond his study of Tibetan philosophy and religious practice. He's particularly interested in the environment, in gender issues, social justice. And much like his predecessor, the compassionate care of animals is extremely important to him, and he's living as a vegetarian for the last eight years. He is also a playwright and a director. He, he wrote and produced a six play act on the life of Milarepo, uh, combining elements of traditional Tibetan opera and modern theater, and I really wish I could see that. I think it might be available on YouTube. Among, um, among other ama amazing things, he has recently announced in a very historically important act that he will convene a platform to begin ordaining women as Tibetan bhikshunis in the Mular Savasavada tradition. <laughs> and this has huge, huge significance for global Buddhism today. And he's also creating green monasteries all across the Himalayan region. The Divinity School re requested that His Holiness would speak to us about some of his ideas and hopes and visions for the future, his ethical concerns about the future of life on planet Earth in the 21st century today. Uh, let me just close by saying, first of all, that His Holiness is accompanied on this tour by his elder sister, Jetsumang Mudrup Belzum, and by several senior scholars, nuns, and monks in his entourage. It is really my great honor to welcome him and his entourage to Harvard, to Harvard Divinity School and the Memorial Church. Jack Harmapa Keno, Tuchensi. Someone on the
first. I'd like to greet uh, everyone here uh, at uh, my first visit to Harvard University and Harvard Divinity School. I want to greet all of you, uh, professors, aspiring scholars, students, and everyone who's here. I can actually speak some English. Um, I feel that I speak it somewhat poorly. I certainly don't think my English is up to Harvard standards. <laughs> so therefore, I brought a translator. The wonderful translator, I think. Um, Jesus, <laughs> I did plastic surgery. <laughs> that looks like a little bit. <laughs> that is kind of junk. Young girl, young girl, young as Professor Jomso mentioned, uh, the 16th Jawan Karmapa uh, came to the United States as one of the first uh, Tibetan Buddhist masters to bring the Tibetan Buddhist teachings to Western countries. And during that time, did indeed, as she said, visit Harvard University. She remarked that my face resembles his. Perhaps I've had plastic surgery in order to make it so. And then he said, that's a kind of Some joke. Some people say. But in any case, um, whether I resemble my predecessor or not, I'm very, very glad to be back here. And also in consideration of the, uh, that I'm following on a pre previous visit by His Holiness the Dalai Lama to this very church. Send this sensing the child, Tina Lolia, and the Gisha was in his coverage. Charlie, the Imbina, Kandaria, and the Ring Asia, the then topic, the Tangisum and Singi, and the Mississippi with Nalolia, the Bullingi, that is Sosa, somewhere with Kendro, Sosa Namia, Kashura Daji, Simguru Senatado, Yanaji, Telia. I've had a busy day, actually a little bit too busy, especially when you consider that the, uh, my main thing today was to come here and address all of you uh, at this talk. But nevertheless, I will do my best to address the topic you've presented, how to care for life, living things on Earth, this planet, in the 21st century. Today, I'm 
To start with, the real essence of the Buddha's teachings is interdependence, the view that everything is interdependent. Interdependent Bring it to emotional level. Senator Ando, Kandarjis. Take some talk to Alia, Kandis, and dig Dinjungi, Jintanti, Kandis, some Tong Brasati, Hajan Kajum, but you told you. But I think it's extremely important that we not leave the doctrine or idea of interdependence as a mere philosophical idea, but that we actually ask ourselves the question. How can I live according to interdependence? How can I apply interdependence in my life, including my emotional life? During this year, we are all here. Social media, the data, the information, the errors, we are checking the data, we are checking the data. 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 We can all surely observe that in this 21st century, through social media and other technologies, in this era of information, as we call it, in our mutual interdependence is even more obvious than ever before. Information somewhere where that's the need to catch where that's the Mahuchi Antolia that Mahuchi have a DTB, Pingy or Mana. Some some also Nyang Azu Sabaliaji inform more information we get that we need to the Matsu Chiseru Jaro to Javach have ready now. Chick Jana. We need to tell you that the main match of the city. We need to tell you information. Mountain, I was a good drink. Do we have a rich? Marie was hard. This one I own. However, information alone is not enough. Well, from one point of view, we might say that the more information we have, the clearer our situation becomes. Sometimes we have so much information that it's too much and it actually obscures us and prevents us from understanding our situation. Information Understanding Understanding so interdependence is not just about the sharing of information or an understanding we might arrive at in our brains, in our heads. It is about the sharing the feelings in our hearts and about our real experience. Springtime, Tonga is the spring way. Hello. Tonga? Autumn. 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 Okay. <laughs> I thought he's asleep. <laughs> Autumn way. Larry? That Tonga Chica can't keep up with it. Payulia, and it was a drawing. 
Ada ni aja kalau kalau zor di syar syar sih ada, jadi ada syar ini tu zaman yang aja lagi gosok sama ni, semacam ni deh, aja zaman zaman tu 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 je lihat ni semacam ni sih ada, tu semacam ni sih betul ya, aja semacam ni sih dah ni, aja pun semacam ni sih dah dah, di Tetapi di sini kerja saya factory, di di sini cerita nanti mai ini betul. Kadang-kadang di sini cerita nanti lelaki pun cuma ramai. Yang mana di kerja saya tadi, jadang macam ni, sini cerita kerja pada dalam di sini cerita. Di lelaki pun cuma ramai. Sini cerita lelaki macam ni, bukan mana. Tapi cuci, sama sahaja cuci cerita tu gugur mentor. Yang aku cerita mentor, kadang-kadang siapa yang gugur cuci. Tapi kerja dia lagi apa? Jadi subuh sama minat. Subuh sama minat dia macam tu macam ni. Tapi siapa 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 orang? Tadi tu semasa saya berkala, tadi orang orang saya buat cengkuh tu. Tadi tu zaman berapa? Tiada masuk berapa? Nih leh masuk berapa? Cawan berapa? Tadi kalau sudah, nih sih saya nak cengkuh tu. Nih sih saya ada ngasuh lagi. Nampu je, eh, nampai lagi sih dia. Jadi nih sih jadi seni mampu je sih dia. Jadi jadi nih sih ini dah kau mata. Tapi ni ada jenis ni jadi cuma main biar jadi masuk apa? Nampu je nih sih apa nampu je. Tadi ni sih. Rangke ngangke yang dia harus tu siang dia. Tapi ni kalau tu sejuk tu dia siar mana? Asam je dia siar. Tapi kalau siar siar, siar tu, ya, siar leh siar tu dia yang siar segar macam tu. Ni ni kan yang tu. Ni kalau tu siar ni, sama sama ni nang mi tu siar ngang gogo tangce. Asam je siar berkor. Ngang ti liu na, ada ni je dis disturb je dia. Sama sama gogo tangce je ti liu. Tapi dia ni tu tu cuma ni. I can remember an experience that I had as a child when I was three or four, where I was living then. In the autumn, as nomads, we would have to uh, slaughter some animals since we relied upon meat as one of our principal uh, sources of food. Now, nomads, of course, don't get their meat in a market that's been slaughtered in a factory. You have to do it yourself, and it's not easy. Mostly, it was done by my family. They would bind the mouth. No, no not my family. Somebody we were by the community. Hiding, hiding something. Oh. Mostly, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mostly, it was done by the people binding the uh, jaws or mouth of the animal, so it would slowly suffocate. Now, this is an agonizing way to kill an animal, as it takes, at least in my memory, almost half an hour sometimes for the, the animal to die. Before it's dead, it's covered in sweat uh, from it, its agony and slow suffocation. And I, I clearly remember this. And I remember the way I would feel as a young child watching this. I had an unbearable feeling in my heart. I wouldn't want to call it compassion. I don't know if what I felt then corresponds to a strict definition of compassion or not. But it was a very intense feeling. So that uh, it got to the point where when the slaughtering was going to occur, they would trick me and send me uh, somewhere else so I wouldn't be around and wouldn't disturb them doing it. Did you say that Bhutan Junjibje, no educated Somarwe, and Dana Singhi, not much knowledge Somar, did you, in a Korang itu cuma mimpi soalan untuk tulis saja. Tadi ni lo dengan kalau ya, kamu baca. Tadi ni kemudian kamu baca kerja dia apa dia je. Entah highly education tu baru si nama sange itu cerita lagi. Si ni amle, tapi lo bujang topu tu tu siapa ni? Jadi mimpi awak jadi sambil nanda, tu kamu baca kerja dia, cerita dia je. Tapi kalau siapa je kerja dia je, spiritual. Kalau kualiti zaman ni, cuci lagi, yang dah ini tu pun, siapa je yang kaya cing, kita zaman ni tengok orang macam ni, macam ni. Tapi ini ni, ni dos pa, kalau cedek lor ni, sama dengan tu zaman. Kalau cumi dah zaman ni, dia kan jual dah, go back to see zaman ni, macam ni tu, ni tu sama dengan ambek apa lah? Kau tu tu lagi, ni cun cun kau lagi, cuma main bermain, semai lagi, ni tu tenar lagi. 
Tadachi, that really appreciated so no senandado i miss that so maro da dribjire now remember that at that time at the age of 3 or 4 i was a very young boy with no education whatsoever and not much knowledge or experience of things but nevertheless i had this natural and genuine feeling of sorrow and compassion well, at the age of seven, I was recognized as the Karmapa and put on a high throne and began to receive um, a very thorough uh, education. Now, people usually, when they think of the Jawan Karmapa, they think of someone who must have tremendous spiritual qualities. But I have to say to you that when I think back and remember the unfabricated compassion, I felt for those slaughtered animals as a young and uneducated child. I miss that degree of genuine, unfabricated feeling. And I think that in some ways, uh, it surpasses the, the compassion that I can generate now through lots of education and thought and so on. And therefore, I really appreciate the memory of that uh, uneducated compassion I had as a child, and I miss it. Read the I think that children, especially very young children, have an innate capacity for uh, genuine love and love. For example, how often have we all seen that when one child is crying, another child will immediately start crying as well? Because they recognize the feeling and they naturally sympathize with it and share it. I think we're all capable of this, not just with other human beings. I think our sympathy can extend to all living beings, including animals. And I don't think this has anything to do with whether we regard ourselves as spiritual or not or whether we are educated or not. I think it is an innate part of being human. And the Kanda, that's 
Rashmi ji, grown up somewhere. Kind of long story, gay on this time. As a church in it, and Kashmir ji, you did share those over the church in it. Then I'll careful to charge that. Young can Kashmir is in God, they won't be charged. That the day shall win us some twenty in the charge. And the day you turn back and Nizu As we grow up, we are subjected to various changes in our environments and circumstances. And I think that these can cause our innate compassion to become obscured. It's almost as though we're born with the compassion button switched on and it gets switched off. Because as adults, now we need to think about it. It doesn't come as easily to us. And when we think about the suffering of another and the possibility of taking responsibility for helping them, we always think, well, would doing so harm me or help me? How would it affect my life? In one way, this is because we are, as we like to say, grown up. We're educated and we're therefore careful, even clever maybe strategic. And so we're clever enough to think, well, this doesn't involve me. I don't feel connected to that. And also to worry about the risk that we might be posing to ourselves by uh, feeling compassion uh, for others. And I think all of this tends to obscure or repress our innate uh, love and compassion. Says a ninja is not to think of ninja somewhere, to ninja sometime, to generate some of the change. The Hindustane, that the young Shevala as encouragement. That is the Nizi Chevore Saji, my name, and Nizi Chendu Gitakanda. Cartway, voluntarily somewhere dedicated Yana, she seems you down. Compassion, after all, is not a thought. It is a feeling. And it's not something that we can really inculcate or even encourage particularly. Compassion is something that each of us has to volunteer through our natural courage and benevolence. And that benevolence is really the root of compassion. The Indusane, Azudi, Tangishiban and Singi, Azu, Tinjung, Tawas and Tandu, and the Tawachi woman, Taka, the Tinjung in Tansade, Mizina Lolly and Azu, the Musu, Azu, Yamsu, Noya, the Stakanda. Chigitilian, Lady 
但我才不是那样的,但我才不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是不是
When I did America and did use a Langal, the Texas barbecue in the tones. When I arrived in India in the year 2000, and I met several American friends who would say, well, when you come to the United States, we'll offer you barbecue. We have this amazing way to cook meat in our country called barbecue. And you... Well, by the time I got here, the first time in 2008, I'd already uh, committed to never eating meat again. Uh, and so it was too late. So I never actually got to taste barbecue. And the, but I would be driven along highways and I'd see Texas barbecue on the side of the road. And it would make me salivate, but it's too late. Nowadays, while from one point of view we're made extremely comfortable by the way we do things, the way we do things also conceals a great deal from our sight, such as the process that culminates in the meat we eat. And so we lose an awareness of our connection to things. And that we have to therefore deepen our awareness of our interdependence. Disaster, somewhere in the day, and Zombinian, in a deep disaster, the caressana. Chicksena, Nazo, the Yamdo, Yedemsi, Nazo Hamaoj, Apatisad, Mazuki, Semlia, Nezi, the Edems. They did disaster, Shanans of Shadi. They turned the neg to what is so, not to avoid Shetuare. In a tender disaster, Susugi, Semlia Vinza, and they avoid Shadi, Kabshu Chigore, says a deacon Zen and Tame. Responsibility, interdependent responsibilities, let them have a burden of the name 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 That's more or less all I'm going to say, but I want to leave you with one thought. 
When we talk about uh, having compassion regarding the many disasters that occur in this world, usually we think of things such as uh, horrific epidemics, wars, violence, starvation, and so on. But there is one source of disaster that we often uh, fail to recognize, which is a lack of love. A lack of love can cause people to have no help when they need help, and no friend when they need a friend. So in a sense, the most dangerous thing in the world is apathy. We think of weapons, violence, warfare, and disease as terrible dangers, and indeed they are. But we can take measures to avoid them. But once our apathy takes hold of us, we can no longer avoid it. So I urge you to feel a love that is courageous. Not courageous in the sense of the grudging undertaking of a heavy burden in feeling responsible for the welfare of others, but the joyous acknowledgement of your interdependence with each, with each, every other living being and with this environment itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.